Hello, I'm Phil Carstairs and I'm going to discuss today why pots break. Pottery is one of the most studied topics in archaeology. Archaeologists create typologies and chronologies of ceramics. They analyse them in terms of manufacture, trade and fashion. Pots are interpreted as markers of culture and class. They become a proxy for meals. Bowls mean soup or stew, plates mean meat and two veg. Teapots and cups display the British middle class way of life, whether at high status sites, in urban slums or the Australian outback. Pots embody abstractions and big ideas. Yet people hardly ever interrogate the pot about what has happened to it, how or why it ended up in the archaeological record, how it broke. Either because the answer seems obvious, a clumsy servant dropped it, or an unruly gathering like this one resulted in wholesale destruction. Or people may not ask the question because the answer is too difficult to find. To paraphrase one eminent ceramic specialist, there are any number of possible explanations and they depend on a limitless range of variables. Nevertheless, these questions are important for understanding how the source of our grand conclusions came into being, as well as telling us something about how people used pots. So today I'm going to share some preliminary results from a research project that I've started and discuss why pots break and what the archaeological implications are. Pots are made of clay and clay is easily shaped when it's mixed with water. It holds its shape when it's dried and then when heated enough the fine particles fuse together and it develops a hard rigid structure. Once fired ceramics cannot deform unlike metals which can bend. Pottery does not conduct electricity and it tends to conduct heat poorly in comparison to metals. It's strong in compression but weak in tension, torque and shearing. These properties make pottery vulnerable to impact, bending and thermal shock. Pottery breaks when we subject it to these stresses because unlike a plastic or metal, for example, it cannot adapt its shape to absorb the stress. Its hard organized structure, however, means that it breaks predictably. And by reassembling a pot from its fragments, we can understand the forces that broke it. Typically, we think of ceramics breaking when they're subject to a sudden impact, either being hit by a hard object or by hitting a hard surface. The impact creates shock waves which travel through the pot. Because the pot cannot adapt or absorb the shock, it breaks. A more gentle impact might simply chip the pot or crack it. A greater force will shatter it. So here we can see one side of the mug's rim hitting a hard surface with force. The impact creates a crack which runs rapidly around the mug, exiting the rim on the other side, forcing a chip off as it does. As the crack meets the join between the base and the wall of the mug, the crack propagates. As the impact continues, the cracks propagate further. The force of the impact is dissipated by a large amount of shattering and splintering because the mug is hard and rigid. So I've started looking at how ceramics break using modern hard white earthenware and ironstone type vessels. These may approximate the best quality 19th century pottery, but are harder and stronger than many earlier types. There are three main ways in which ceramics can break, impact, thermal stress and bending, and each way produces different results. So here we can see the difference between impact and thermal shock on two identical plates. The one on the left was broken by dropping it from a height of one meter onto a hard surface, striking the ground on the base. The plate on the right was subject to uneven heating over a gas flame. The impact caused the plate on the left to crack. The crack crosses the plate, propagating into further cracks as it goes. At the point where the shock wave reaches the edge of the plate, it has produced many small sherds, and all the sherds are angular. 
In contrast, the plate broken by heat has broken into a few large sherds only, and the fractures are curved and wavy, and the fractures are mostly at right angles to both the surface of the plate and to its edges. Here is a second pair of plates of a slightly harder semi-porcelain type fabric. The left hand plate was dropped on its edge. This has produced a large amount of spalling at the impact point and where the shock wave exits the plate a single large shirt has come off. The right hand plate was subject to extreme heat. Again the impact and thermal fractures look very different. Mugs and bowls behave similarly, although their curved shape influences the shape of the fractures. The impact damage on the edge of the bowl creates a 45 degree fractures typical of this type of damage. The edges of ceramics are frequently subject to bumps and knocks that create these edge chips, which display conchoidal fractures. This is similar to the fracture pattern observed when napping flint. The chip becomes a weak spot which can form a starting point for later cracks. As well as these macroscopic differences between different types of damage, there are microscopic differences which we will come on to. But first, plate bending. Breaking modern ceramics by bending is difficult as they're very strong in comparison to 18th and 19th century earthenware. The loading placed on this plate was significantly more than might be expected in normal use. Bending stresses would normally have resulted from holding a loaded plate by the edge or putting weight on top of it. Macroscopically, the result is similar to impact, although the sherds are less angular and less splintered. So now if we look much more closely at the fracture surfaces of our sample of broken plates, we'll be able to see differences between impact thermal and bending fractures. The fracture surface, surface of sherds from impact breaks is often rough. At points along the fracture, one side of the fracture will have a slight overhanging lip, with the opposing side having a slight hollow or negative. The angle of the fracture surface is not always at 90 degrees to the surface of the plate and varies along the line of the crack. In contrast, thermal fractures have a smooth surface and occur at 90 degrees to the plate surface and often at 90 degrees to the plate edge. The only unevenness occurs at the point where the ceramic body changes shape. The fracture is much cleaner than an impact break. So a close-up view of these fracture surfaces shows the ragged edge of the impact fracture and the smooth edge of the thermal break. Bending fractures also produce a lipped overhang at the point of the greatest compression where the crack initiates with a matching negative on the opposite fracture surface, like in this example. A very distinctive feature of bending fractures are ripples or waves running along the edge of the side of the fracture which was compressed. Bending also produces a ragged edge to the break and spalling. Textbooks on ceramic technology report other differences visible microscopically in fracture surfaces, which I have yet to consider in my study. So how were ceramics broken historically and archeologically? We've considered impact, but how did thermal and bending fractures occur? In grander 18th and 19th century houses, the kitchens might be located at some distance from the dining room, and most people like their food and most beverages to be warm or hot. Preheating plates and bowls was routine. Better equipped kitchens had plate warmers. These were open back racks that held plates which could then be brought close to the open fire. If this was done too quickly or if the fire was too hot, thermal stress might occur. And if plates or bowls were not warmed, the sudden addition of hot food might itself cause heat stress. For poorer households, just leaning a plate in front of the open fire 
would serve the same purpose. And so here is George Morland, the great but flawed Georgian artist, who is making his poverty a topic of his own art, with an already damaged plate warming before his open fire while his servant is cooking. So how does heat actually break ceramics? Ceramics are rigid. Because ceramics conduct heat poorly, heating and cooling will cause different parts of a pot to try to expand or contract at different rates to other parts. If a pot is heated suddenly from room temperature, its surface attains a very high temperature in a very short period of time while its core remains cooler. The surface expands while the core does not. This produces compression at the surface and tension in the core. The core is literally pulled by the expanding surface. And if this change in temperature is too sudden, the ceramic will fail, and this is called thermal shock. Similarly, if a hot ceramic is suddenly cooled, the reverse happens. Repeated cycling between two temperatures that is not sufficient to shatter a pot will still cause small cracks that do not go through the whole body. This is known as thermal fatigue. A thermal fatigued pot will often sound dead or dull rather than having a bright ring of an uncracked piece. Ultimately, with enough thermal fatigue, a pot will simply fall apart or break at the slightest offence. Glaze crazing is caused by the differential expansion between the glaze and the body of the ceramic and is more prevalent in earthenware as the glaze and body are less well fused. We might not think of bending pottery because it's hard and rigid. However, it can be subject to bending forces. For example, when a full plate is held by one edge only. 18th century household manuals advise that servants should always hold the plate with both hands. So for example, Simmons advised in 1800 that an ideal footman when waiting at table should put on or remove the largest dishes, not with one hand, but with both, lest the gravy should be spilled or the rim of a china dish should break in his hand with the weight of its contents. Servants may actually have been getting the blame unfairly for breaking dishes that were already thermally stressed by doing this. Although this illustration shows the dangers of holding dishes by the edge only. The evidence from archaeological assemblages indicate that sometimes we can identify breakage patterns. And while I have not yet analysed assemblages for fracture patterns specifically, some examples from assemblages that I've already studied clearly display the same fracture patterns that we have observed in my experimental examples. So here are two plates from the assemblage excavated at the King's Arms Uxbridge. The creamware plate on the left shows the angular impact fractures and the plate is broken into over 20 sherds. The white salt glazed stoneware plate on the right has clearly been broken by heat. It is broken into only three sherds. One slightly wavy, clean fracture line divides the plate into two halves. Different plates within the assemblage have different histories. These four plates are from a late 18th century assemblage on Quaker Street, London, all display characteristic thermal breaks. And finally here we have what appear to be impact fractures from a slightly later deposit at the Quaker Street site. The sherds are angular and the vessels have been broken into many more pieces. These archaeological examples relate mostly to nearly complete vessels. Unless a lot of the pot survived, diagnosis may be tricky. Coarse grain fabrics and soft earthenwares may be more difficult to analyse as the fracture surfaces will be rougher and different shapes and fabrics will behave differently. I'll also need to take into account the effect of pre-existing damage that may predispose a vessel to breaking in a certain way. And post-depositional effects such as pressure, weathering, ageing, soil movement and excavation will all affect the patterns of fracture and its visibility.
So while this research is primarily aimed at understanding the life cycle of pottery and understanding how the assemblages which we excavate came into being, it will shed light on other areas. How did manufacturers address fragility, bearing in mind people used different vessels and different wares in different ways? How do assemblages differ in terms of the fracture patterns and why? Are heat broken ceramics more likely to be repaired than impact fractures? Can we apply this type of analysis to ceramics from earlier periods? So, what next? I will need to look at breakage patterns in softer bodied ceramics. This is likely to be a challenge as my local charity shops don't keep this type of material in stock. I'll need to undertake microscopic examination of the fracture surfaces. This is likely to be important for considering complex breakage patterns and particularly in distinguishing secondary breakage or post disposal damage. I'll then need to start applying this to archaeological assemblages in detail. And one question which already comes to mind is that is the degree of brokenness of a vessel evidence of actually how it broke? It would seem that impact fractures create a great deal more sherds than thermal fractures do. Well, thank you for listening and I would welcome any comments and feedback.